Release the hound. <laughs> listening to the hounds of diana i'm your host harrison katz good evening everyone it is monday september 5th 2022 thank you so so much for joining me this evening uh if you happen to be listening to this live uh this would be the labor day holiday in the united states today september 5th and as that is the day, <laughs> I thought that I would carry that over into the theme of tonight's show. And we're going to talk a little bit about some things this evening. But before we, before we get there, before we get there, I would like to start off in Scripture as I do every week this Tonight's scripture reading will be from the book of Romans, chapter 16 and verses 18 and 19. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good war words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Actually, I'm sorry. I'm just going to stop right there at verse 18. And what I want to highlight is at the end of that verse, and by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. Well, of course, here in the book of Romans, Paul is discussing, you know, he's talking about doctrine. He's saying, you know, you know, stick to the doctrine that I've that I've that you've learned, you know, in in the scriptures, and anyone that teaches you, contrawise. But who are the simple? These fair speeches that deceive the hearts of the simple. Who are they? Well, that's us, everyone. That's you. That's me. Uh, that's our. Our, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, uh, our grandparents, uh, for, for generations and generations, specifically in, in America, in the United States, the Americans have come, become so simple in their thinking. And when you go to the underlying Greek here in this verse, and you see what the definition here is. It says it's without guile or without fraud. Harmless, okay, innocent in a way. Fearing no evil from others. Distrusting no one. And you see this is in fact exactly what is going on. We have become so trusting to the state to the quote unquote experts to the to the to the to the academics to the quote unquote, uh whenever there is an uh an aspect in our life where we are void of information we are so quick to turn to the first expert we see for their judgment and most of the time we will not take the time in for ourselves to actually look into it, to, to study it for ourselves and come up with our own opinions, our own private judgments on the matter, but instead just take what someone else says and parrot it. And I pray that that is not what you do as you listen to me here this evening. For I, I tell you, I am just as naive and just as simple as anyone else out there. I found another good definition for naive, and that has to do with, this is reading from the Cambridge Dictionary, it's too willing to believe that someone is telling the truth, 
that people's intentions in general are good, or that life is simple and fair. People are often naive because they are young and or have not had much experience of life. We were all naive. We were all simple until we found the truth in that certain matter, in that certain aspect, in that certain situation, in that certain relationship. We have all been naive in our lives. And what we need to come to grasp with is that we are constantly in this condition simply because we are not omniscient. We are not as God. We cannot know everything, but we have to be constantly open to learning. You have to understand that you don't know what you don't know. So if you already close your mind off to that, if you've already said, well, I've learned everything I have about this subject, and you close the book on it, metaphorically, when someone else, maybe with some different ideas, comes along, you're not going to be open to hearing what they have to say. So we've all been naive. We've all been simple-minded, too trusting in those around us, uh, abdicating, um, acquiescing, volunteering by silence. And you see, the thing is, is this is all, all everything that's been done to us. You want to talk about Labor Day? You want to talk about your labor, where your labor is going, what your labor is paying for, and they give you a day, and and this wicked, just backwards military government, just throw it in your face and say, "Happy Labor Day." You get one paid day off. Congratulations. But what did they take from you, from us? And, and in return, give us our one, our one day. Well, this is where you were going to have to start to, to open your mind to that everything that you see on the surface is not always as it seems. And having said that, I want to read to you, to you a maxim from canon law, and this is out of the official catechism of the Catholic Church, the second edition, and this is from the September 8th, 1997, uh, Pope John Paul II, when they updated and changed a few words of this catechism, and I want to point out to you here on lines, what is it, 2483. So prior to the change in this catechism, in this canon law, it read here in line 2843 in the second edition. To lie is to speak or act against the truth in order to lead into error someone who has the right to know the truth. But since then, the sentence has been modified to read, to lie is to speak or act against the truth in order to lead someone into error. You see, what they have omitted is the someone who has the right to know the truth. And you need to think about that. Do you have the right to know the truth? <clears throat> Pardon me. And if, in fact, you believe you do have the right to know the truth, will you actually stand on that right and learn? So before we move on into tonight's new information, I want to do a little bit of house cleaning um, in regards to a document, or I should say a purported document that I read on last week's broadcast, specifically the supposed transcript from 
a Republican congressman, I'm sorry, Ohio uh, congressman, James Traficant, from March 17th, 1933. Now, again, in my naivete, I had found that that, cita that purported citation kind of last minute and decided, okay, this is very important. I need to put this on air. But afterwards, considering the graveness of that speech, I decided to, to, that I needed to do my due diligence and seek out the source. So I figured, well, let me go look on C-SPAN. Right, 1993, this should all be covered, should all be recorded. And I did, in fact, find the clip. And it's very interesting. In the video clip, Mr. Traficant's speech, the very first paragraph is the same as in the, the speech that I quoted to you. But after that, it's all different. It's all different. And in the middle of the video recording, there is a very odd... Uh, almost like the record skipped and reround like like two to three seconds, and I went back and kind of went through that whole day, that whole recording. I think it was somewhere like between seven and eight hours of that whole house session, and that was the only time that the video skipped like that. And not only that, I said, well. Since it's possible they're playing games with the videotape, with such an explosive speech, let me go into the actual congressional record, pull the record for that day, go through the transcript, and find it. And so I did so, and the document, which is sitting right here in front of my – well, sitting on my computer. I don't have it pulled up, but it's someone 970-some-odd pages from that day and the arguments during that uh, – uh, it was a uh, – they were arguing over passing of the budget, and the speech that – the speech that's in the video is the same as what is in – or if that is on the record. That is not to say that, that what I read to you could not potentially be, in fact, what James Traficant said because I will tell you this. 95 percent of what I read to you. I can verify, in fact, in law. There's only a very small percentage of what he said that I'm still trying to track down. So the fact that it was such a bombshell of truth, he would no doubt want to cover that up and cover its sources up online, whether you have to go to the Congress the congress.gov uh, website to download their PDF document or go to C-SPAN, which is, again, controlled by, controlled and overseen by, uh, by the government there to get those official uh, tape recordings. So I say that to say this. If anybody has or knows of an old copy from the transcript of the House budget hearing, March 17, 1933, House session, Please send it to my email at hlk122198888 at gmail.com because as of now, I have to recant what I had to say last week when I said that it could potentially be the uh, – or, or that it was uh, – what, what did I say? Top three, top five most important uh, state speech or speeches by a uh, United States politician ever. Well – I still stand by that somewhat and say it has potential to still be, but as of right now, I cannot verify that it is in fact – that James Traficant in fact said that, even though the many – much of what is said and contained in what I read is true, I cannot verify its source. So we cannot be naive and simple and just assume things anymore. We have been assuming things for far, far too long. And so now I want to read to you probably for the rest of this evening. We're going to be reading from a couple articles – or not really articles, uh, uh, really kind of short essays that I have found 
in my research at a very interesting blog spot uh, website called Stop the Pirates. Stop the Pirates dot blogspot. Very interesting, very good research and information, though I will say some of the he does go into great detail in some aspects, but in others kind of just brushes by. But I understand in teaching you it's hard to not overload people with too much information. So in understanding what's going on with our labor, in understanding what's going on with this country, and understanding what was going on um, when James Trafficant supposedly gave that explosive speech that I read on on air last week, to understand these things, how we got to the point we are at now in this country financially, economically, and what is going on truly with our economy behind the scenes, we need to go back in history a little bit. And in fact, we need to go back over 700 years in history, back to the 14th century. And we need to discuss the claim of legal ownership of all souls by the Vatican since no later than the year 1306. And when we get back from this break, we will we'll begin reading about the Vatican's role in the trading of the souls of men. Join me on the other side with the Hounds of Diana. Listening to 24 7 World Radio, home of Eric John Phelps and Vatican Assassins. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24 7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags amerikanische Zeit für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bude Nico. Ich bin hartelijk uitgenodigd um elke Dienstag um 2 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit Het Duitse Bijbel Waarheidsuur te volgen en drie uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbel Waarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. This is Eric John Phelps. Please listen to my broadcast, The Eric John Phelps Show, as I preach the true gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Defend the Protestant Reformation that birthed Western civilization and expose the counter-reformation of the Jesuit order seeking to make the Pope of Rome the universal monarch of the world. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on 247worldradio.com. This is 247 World Radio, home of Eric John Phelps and Vatican Assassins. Welcome back to the Hounds of Diana, everyone. I am your host, Harrison Katz. So let us begin. Let us begin in this history of how the papacy and its claim to the legal ownership of all souls. Now, what is this all about? Well, we are going to be discussing the first trust of the world. Unum Sanctum is one of the most frightening documents of history and one 
and the one most quoted as the primary documents of the popes claiming their global power. It is an express trust deed. The last line reads, quote, Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff, end quote. It is not only the first trust deed in history, but also the largest trust ever conceived, as it claims the whole planet and everything on it conveyed in trust. Now, I don't know, as, uh, as an aside, I don't necessarily know that that is true, that it was the first trust deed in history, but we'll continue moving on. The Triple Crown of Baal, a.k.a. the Papal Tierra and Triregnum. In 1302, Pope Boniface issued his infamous papal bull, Unum Sanctum, the first express trust. He claimed control over the whole planet, which made him, quote, king of the world. In celebration, he commissioned a gold-plated headdress in the shape of a pine cone with an elaborate crown at its base. The pine cone is an ancient symbol of fertility and one traditionally associated with Baal as well as the cult of Sibyl. It also represents the pineal gland in the center of our brains, crystalline in nature, which allows us to access God. Hence, the 13-foot-tall pine cone in Vatican Square. Think about why the pontiffs would idolize a pine cone, the first crown of crown land. Pope Boniface VII was the first leader in history to create the concept of a trust, but the, but the first testamentary trust through a deed and will creating a deceased estate was created by Pope Nicholas V in 1455 through a papal bull, Romanus Pontifex. This is only one of three papal bulls to include the line with the incipit, quote, for a perpetual remembrance. End quote. This bull had the effect of conveying the right of use of the land as real property from the express trust unum sanctum to the control of the pontiff and his, his successors in perpetuity. Now, something to mention here as a side note, which is not mentioned in this article, is that one of the pope's many titles is beneficiary to the world trust beneficiary to the world trust that is a title that the pope claims to have continuing the first crown oh let me let me go back hence all land is claimed as quote crown land end quote this first crown is represented by the first sestic v trust created when a child is born it deprives us all deprives us of all beneficial entitlements and rights on the land now what is a sesta q v trust well according to black's fifth here it is the person whose life measures the duration of a trust a gift an estate or an insurance contract now listen to this it is the person for whose life, that is the duration of their life, any lands, tenements, or hereditaments are held. Okay, that means land, real property and chattel, and, and anything that can be inherited, right? Your inheritance, your estate, that all that is held for you in trust. Okay, moving on. The second crown of the Commonwealth. The second crown was created in 1481 with the papal bull Eterni Regis. That is spelled A E T E R N I, Eterni Regis, meaning eternal crown, by Sixtus IV, being only the second of three papal bulls as deeds of testamentary trusts. The papal bull created the, quote, crown of Aragon later known as the crown of Spain, and is the highest sovereign and highest steward 
of all the Roman slave subjects to the rule of the Roman pontiff. And I believe the, there still is a king of, what is it, King Juan Carlos of Spain, Knight of Malta, Knight of, uh, Knight of St. Sylvester. Um, yeah, okay, speaking to, to, to that. That Spain, that same, that same papal, papal crown. Spain lost its crown in 1604 when it was granted by, granted to King James I of England by Pope Paul V after the successful passage of the quote Union of the Crowns or Commonwealth in 1605, after the false flag operation of the Gunpowder Plot, which was a Jesuit plot. The crown was finally lost by England in 1975 when it was returned to Spain and King Carlos I, where it remains to this day. The second crown is represented by the two Sesta QV trusts created when a child is born and by the sale of the birth certificate as a bond to the private central bank of the nation, depriving us of ownership of our flesh and condemning us to perpetual servitude as a Roman person or slave. So that's the second crown of the papal tiara. The third crown of the ecclesiastical see. Third crown was created in 1537 by Pope Paul III through the papal bull convocation, also meant to open the Council of Trent. It is the third and final testamentary deed and will of the testamentary trust set up for the claiming of all, quote, lost souls and, quote, lost to the sea, lost to the S.E. E. Okay. So you have the papacy by the start, by the open of the Council of Trent was setting up their claim to the world trust, claiming all the, quote, lost souls that have been lost to the Holy See. Now, if you see the obvious wordplay going on here, good. Keep that in mind. The Venetians assisted in the creation of the first Sesta QV Act of 1540 to use this papal bull as the basis of ecclesiastical authority of Henry VIII. This crown was secretly granted to England in the collection and, quote, reaping of lost souls. The crown was lost in 1816 due to the due to the deliberate bankruptcy of England and granted to the Temple Bar, which became known as the Crown Bar or simply the Crown. The Bar Association have since been responsible for administering the, quote, reaping of the souls of the lost and the damned, including the registration and collection of baptismal certificates representing the souls collected by the Vatican and stored in its vaults. This third crown is represented by the third Sesta Q V Trust, created when a child is baptized. It is the parent's grant of the baptismal certificate, the title to the soul, to the church or registrar. Thus, without legal title over one's own soul, we will be denied legal standing and will be treated as things, cargo without souls. Upon, upon which the bar is now legally able to enforce maritime law. I'm, you can't see it, but I'm shaking my head because, like I said, my, this, the man's research is very good in this historical respect. Very good. A Sesta QV Trust. A Sesta QV trust is a fictional concept. It is a temporary, testamentary trust, first created during the reign of Henry VIII of England during the Sesta QV Act of 1540 and updated by Charles II through the Sesta QV Act of 1666, wherein an, an estate may be affected for the benefit of a person presumed, listen, presumed lost or abandoned at, quote, C. I'll read that again. Through the Sesta QV Act of 1666, again, this is going back to British Admiralty Maritime, okay, which is the foundation for American Admiralty Maritime jurisprudence. So understanding this history can 
give you an insight to how we got where we are today. So let me read this last sentence again. Through the Sesta QV Act of 1666, wherein a, an estate may be affected for the benefit of a person presumed lost or abandoned at sea and therefore assumed, quote, dead after seven years. Additional presumptions by which such a trust may be formed were added in later statutes to include bankrupts, minors, incompetence, mortgages, and private companies. The final purpose of the Q of the Sesta QV Trust was to form a temporary estate for the benefit of another, not you, but for the benefit of another because some event, some state of affairs, or some condition prevented you from claiming your status as a living, competent, and, and being present before a competent authority. That's right. He's absolutely right. Because of some event, which would be, of course, going back to March 9th, 1933, some state of affairs being the uh, emergency war powers government that was, quote unquote, temporarily instituted, or the condition being your, quote, deteriorated status as a U.S. citizen, prevented them from claiming their status as living, competent, and present before a competent authority. Therefore, any claims, history, statutes, or arguments that, that deviate in terms of the origin of the function of the, of the SESTA VQ Trust as pronounced by these canons is false and automatically null and void. The beneficiary under a state may be, benef may be either a beneficiary or a SESTA VQ just a QV, excuse me, trust, when a beneficiary loses direct benefit of any property of the higher estate placed in a SESTA QV trust on his behalf, he does not, quote, own the SESTA QV trust, right? So if your property is taken from you, not, ta not taken, not technically not taken, but signed away legally, signed away, your own estate signed away from you, and put into one of these SESTA QV trusts, which is all your inheritance, all title to any land, anything of any real property and value, is set aside, but not for your own use, because you do not own, quote unquote, even though you may be the beneficiary, you do not own the SESTA QV, tr SESTA v QV Trust. He is only the beneficiary of what the trustees of the SESTA QV Trust choose to provide. As all SESTA QV Trusts are created on presumption based upon original purpose and function, such a trust cannot be created if these presumptions can be proven not to exist. All right? The trust cannot be created if the presumptions that they are based upon can be proven to be non-existent. Moving on. Since 1933, again, he, he mentions since 1933, but he does not go in to what happened with the, uh, with the passing of the Emergency Banking Relief Act and all the subsequent New Deal legislation after that. But continuing on, since 1933, when a child is born in a state, in a state under the inferior Roman law, which he's talking, he's referring here to Roman equity, three SESTA QV trusts are created upon certain presumptions specifically designed to deny forever the child any rights of real property any rights to be free, and any rights to be known as a man or a woman, rather than a creature or an animal, by claiming and possessing their soul or spirit. Remember, 
if you have one of these birth certificates, which are akin to a baptismal certificate in Roman Catholic law, they claim ownership of your soul, not just your body, not just your property. The executors or administrators of the higher estate willingly and knowingly, one, convey the beneficial entitlement of the child as beneficiary into the first SESTA-QV trust in the form of a registry number by registering the name, thereby also creating the corporate person, that is the U.S. citizen, the all caps name, and denying the child any rights to real property. Two, this is the, exec the executors and administrators of the higher state willingly and knowingly claim the baby as chattel of to the estate. The slave baby contract is then created by honoring the ancient tradition of either having an ink impression of the baby's feet onto the live birth record or a drop of its blood, as well as tricking the parents to signing the baby away through the deceitful legal meanings on the live birth record, which is a promissory note converted into a slave, into a slave bond sold to the private reserve bank of the estate and conveyed into the second and separate SESTA QV trust per child owned by the bank. Now, I don't necessarily agree with his conclusion here. When he says it's converted into a slave bond. And yeah, but we'll continue on. When the promissory note reaches maturity, now understand this. When the promissory note reaches maturity, at what age do you think your birth certificate reaches maturity? When are you considered an adult? Think about it. Come back after this short break. This is 24-7 World Radio. This is Eric John Phelps. Please listen to my broadcast, The Eric John Phelps Show, as I preach the true gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, defend the Protestant Reformation that birthed Western civilization, and expose the counter-reformation of the Jesuit order seeking to make the Pope of Rome the universal monarch of the world. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on 247worldradio.com. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Bruder Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags amerikanische Zeit für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bruder Nico. U bent hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke dinsdag om 2 uur amerikaanse standardtijd het Duitse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen en drie uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. You're listening to Your Source for the Truth. This is 24-7 World Radio. Welcome back to the Hounds of Diana. I'm your host, Harrison Katz. So, after that break, if you did not guess already, the answer to the question is at the age, the lawful, quote-unquote, lawful age of maturity is 18. But I want to pause here for a second. And what are we talking about here, people? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a lot of – I'm using a lot of legal terms, and again, many of you may be naive 
to many of these concepts. That doesn't mean that you can't go out and, I mean, you can't actually take time out, not go out, but take time out and learn. It can be done. If I can do it, so can you. Now, what is it that we're talking about here? Well, to put it simply, folks, the papacy, the pope, the so-called beneficiary to the world trust, he's no fisher of men. The pope is a pirate. And he wants all your booty and your prize. You see, the Pope claiming to be the vicar of Christ, okay? Claiming to sit in Christ's stead until his return. To rule the world in Christ's place. And so in doing so, he makes these, he has made, not makes, but has made over 700 years ago these claims on all souls. And there, and this is, this is what I'm talking about here is only one outgrowth of this. If you want to talk about all the European quote, quote unquote colonization after Christopher Columbus, that was all done in accordance to this idea of unum sanctum. Okay. When the Portuguese and the Spanish came over to the New World and just started claiming all this land, even though there were people already there, the indigenous people, that all goes back to Unum Sanctum and this quote-unquote title, I shouldn't say that, but this title that the Pope holds as quote-unquote beneficiary of the, world, of the world trust. But let's continue to read on what exactly is happening here? All right. Let's go again for number, let's start again here at this number two. The executors or administrators of the higher state willingly and knowingly claim the baby as chattel to the state. The slave baby contract is then created by honoring the ancient tradition of, he calls us, he's calling the, the birth certificate and the parents filling it out, the slave baby contract, by honoring the ancient tradition of either having an ink impression on the baby's, of the baby's feet onto the live birth record or a drop of the blood, as well as tricking the parents into signing the baby away through a deceitful legal means on a live birth record, which is a promissory note, converted into a slave bond or maybe just a regular bond, sold to the private reserve bank of the, to the, to the private reserve bank of the estate. And I think he means the central bank, and then conveyed it into a second and separate Sestive QV trust per child owned by the bank. Now listen, when the promissory note reaches maturity, which is after the age, which is around the age of 18, and the bank is unable to, quote, seize the slave child, a maritime lien is lawfully issued to salvage, quote-unquote, the lost property and is monetized as currency issued in series against the Q, the SESTA QV trust. Number three, they claim that the child sold via the baptismal certificate. They claim it. Since 1540 in the creation of the first Sesta QV Act, deriving its power from the papal bull of the Roman cult leader, Pope Paul III, in 1540, when a child is baptized and a baptismal certificate is issued, the parents have gifted, granted, and conveyed the soul of the baby to a, quote, third Sesta QV trust owned by the Roman cult which has held this valuable property in its vaults ever since. Since 1815, this third crown of the Roman cult and the third Sesta QV trust, representing ecclesiastical property, has been managed by the bar and or at by the bar as the reconstituted quote gala responsible as grim reapers for the reaping of souls. Each Sesta QV trust created since 1933, which he's speaking of the 
passing of the Emergency Banking Relief Act represents one of the three crowns rep representing the three claims of property of the Roman cult. Real property, which is on earth, personal property, which is the body of the man, woman or child, and the ecclesiastical property, which is your soul. Each corresponds exactly to the three forms of law available to the gala of the bar court. Corporate commercial law, which is which is where the judge is the landlord, maritime and canon law, which where the judge is the banker, and what he calls Talmudic law, where the judge is the priest. What is the real power of a court judge? Given what has been revealed about the foundations of Roman law, what is the real hidden power of the judge we face at court? Is it their superior knowledge of process and procedure or of magic? Or is it something simpler and far more obvious? It is unfortunate that much of the excitement about ex estates and executors has deliberately not been revealed that an has deliberately not revealed that an estate, by definition, has to belong to a trust, to be specific, a testamentary trust or a SESTA QV trust. When we receive legal paper or have or have to appear in court, it is these same SESTA QV trusts which have our rights converted into the property contained within them. Instead of being the trustee or the executor or administrator, we are merely the beneficiary of each SESTA QV trust, granted only beneficial and equitable use of certain property, never legal title. So if the Roman legal system assumes we are merely the beneficiary of these SESTA QV trusts, then we go to court. Then we go to court. Who represents the trustee and office of executor? We all know that all cases are based upon the judge's discretion, which often defies procedures, statutes, and maxims of law. Well, they are doing what any trustee or executor administering a trust in the presence of a beneficiary can do under Roman law. And all the statutes and maxims and procedures are really for show because under the principles of trust law, as first formed by the Romans cult, a trustee has a wide latitude, including the ability to correct any procedural mistakes by obtaining the implied or tacit consent of the beneficiary to obviate any mistakes. The judge is the real and legal name. The judge is the trust itself. We are the mere image of them, the ghost, the dead. It is high sorcery, trickery, and subterfuge that has remained, quote, legal for far too long. Spread the word. Now, that last last paragraph, I don't agree with quite everything he says there, but at the very end, it's very interesting where he says the judge is the trust itself. We are the mere image of them, the ghost, the dead. The dead. Now, it's a very interesting concept in law, civil death. S to be civilly dead, to be, quote, legally, lawfully dead. There's a difference between civil or legal death and natural death. Namely, a medical doctor or some someone with the legal, with the medical capacity can only legal or or issue a natural death certificate a judge can issue a civil death certificate where someone is quote presumed to be dead because they have in fact never shown up for their property but it goes a little deeper than that you see Again, going back to certain things that he did not touch on in that document or did not go into deeply, why the focus on March 9th, 1933 is so important is because not only what happened then, but what happened afterwards, specifically 
the call for the turning in, the mandatory forfeiture of all the gold of every citizen. FDR, FDR deemed us all hoarders, said we couldn't hold real money, real gold anymore. We had to turn it all in. Well, why? Why? Because of, because of what, what happened during the Great Depression, the corporate U.S. was insolvent. It was bankrupt, in fact. So FDR confiscated all the gold. Had everybody turn it all in, took us off the gold standard, then pledged all said golds for all the outstanding debt internationally of the U.S. And then for all future credits and debits and widgets and digits, he pledged something else. He pledged every single one of us, every, quote, person every place, everything. And so in understanding that, in fact, the U.S. is bankrupt and has been since 1933, it is insolvent. It is bankrupt. And you, as a U.S. citizen, are in fact also a bankrupt a bankrupt well what do you think happens when you don't show up you think just the property is deemed abandoned and just confiscated that's it no no you see that property can't be t that that property can't be liquidated and when i say deemed bankrupt i'm not talking about Chapter 7. I'm talking about Chapter 11. Now, some of you may know what I'm – may understand what I'm referring to, but the important part is the whole idea of civil death and how that relates to a bankrupt entity. Now, I want to read to you a quick quote from the Federal Reporter, Cases Argued and Determined in the Circuit – and District Courts of the United States, Volume 21 through 22, published by the West Publishing Company in 1884. Quick paragraph. This is quoting, talking about a U.S. Supreme Court decision, famous one called Bank v. Sherman from 1879. Bank v. Sherman. And in discussing this particular case… The principle stated by the Supreme Court in Bank v. Sherman is, in effect, that the adjudication of bankruptcy in the civil death – let me read that again. The principle stated by the Supreme Court in Bank v. Sherman is, in effect, that the adjudication of bankruptcy is the civil death of the bankrupt. The adjudication of bankruptcy is the civil death of the bankrupt. So far as the management of the estate of the bankrupt is concerned, and his estate must remain in statu quo until an assignee is, an, is appointed who can act for it. An assignee. And well, what, do you, what does an assignee do? Well, an, an assignee makes an, an assignment. Which is what? Which is for the discharge of – it is to satisfy the debtors who are holding the bankruptcy. Now, who's holding the bankruptcy? Well, the bankruptcy – well, that's a, that's a very interesting question because I believe it's passing through all these hands. It's going from your parents' hands to the medical professionals' hands to the straight registrar's hands to the department of uh of of uh of, to the to the treasurer department's hands to the department of commerce to the department of trade or department of transportation hands because they regulate all interstate and intrastate commerce the department of transportation and then ultimately to the hands of the federal reserve now when do they get this when do they get to cash out this is the question 
if if we're all in fact surety and collateral for the national debt how is it that the US gets to collect that money well it is in fact they have to just like just like any other bankrupt corporation that may be going through chapter 7 bankruptcy you have to liquidate the assets so it is it is it any wonder why looking back through all this history why you have FDR in 1933 getting all these things set up in place so by 1930 by uh what is it 19 in the 1940s we can start the second world war why so then we can start liquidating the assets to pay off our central papal bankers who we owe all this debt to and you think that your labor that you work for is actually what you're earning in return for that labor it actually has some value and substance my god people we need to stop being so naive we have to wake up to what is really going on here but we won't have anything and our children won't have anything we already have nothing it's time to wake up until next week god bless